my slides. Uh, so hello, good evening, um, because it's almost evening. Um, I'm speaking to you from um, Dist, a small historical town in Belgium. Um, I would like to talk to, uh, thank the organizers for inviting me um, to talk about something I am very passionate about, and that are weird charts, weird graphics. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my hobby project, which is Xenographics, and then I'll also explain how that relates to raw graphs, and I'll also show you some of the things I made um, with raw graphs, which I think is an, an, an awesome tool. Um, here you see me uh, at the stage of the OpenVis conference in Paris in 2018, where I first introduced Xenographics. Um, so the way I ended up at that stage at one of the biggest visualization conferences, which um, unfortunately doesn't exist anymore, is that um, the conference works by an open call for speakers. And so I submitted um, um, a proposal to talk about um, what I then called xenographics. And xenographics are weird charts in the sense that um, those are charts that go beyond just line charts and bar charts. They are more experimental. Um, and I really believe in the power of some of these weird charts. Sometimes you have data sets that really benefit from a very specific way of visualization. Um, and so I decided to apply to talk at this conference and to my surprise, um, I was selected to be, to be one of the speakers. So in the preparation for my talk, I collected a lot of these xenographics. So I looked through Twitter, I looked through scientific papers about specific okay. visualization techniques um, to come up with a big collection of weird charts. And at the talk, um, at that conference, I talked about what I learned about weird charts when collecting all these examples. Um, in the end, I'll give you the link to my slides and um, behind this screenshot is a link to the video. So if you like, you can watch um, my whole talk on YouTube as well. So what I ended up making is this website called xeno.graphics. Um, and let me just show you um, what it is. And as I said, it's um, a big collection. There are more than 80 Xenographics in the collection. Um, you can scroll through them and you can also open them by clicking the tiles and you'll get um, a link to where I collected this um, weird chart from. So here we have, for example, a visualization that shows you um, probabilities of advancing to the next round for the World Cup in 2018. Um, so it's a combination of um, stacked area chart and, and a bracket um, kind of visualization. Um, not very common, but I, I like it a lot. And not only because Belgium, my home country, ended up playing the semi-final um, in that World Cup. Um, I think it's a, it's a brilliant visualization with a lot of story uh, in it. So that's what I try to do. I, I try to collect as many of these weird charts as possible, and I also tag them. So you have, for example, mashups. Those are visualizations that combine two or more different visualization techniques. You have networks, um, so all kinds of techniques to um, visualize um, graph data. Um, you have domain-specific visualizations, which are very specific to um, some kind of um, niche data sets, uh, often from science um, and many other um, visualizations. So why did I set up this collection? Um, and I think um, I put it here quite clearly in the, on the About page. Um, I wanted to create a repository of novel, innovative, and experimental visualizations to inspire, to fight xenographobia, and to popularize new chart types. Um, so xenographobia is also a new word, and uh, it translates to the fear of weird graphics. 
And um, that's a reaction that many people have when they see a chart that they don't understand. And they don't want to invest the necessary time to understand the chart. And they simply say, this chart is not for me. Um, I'm, I'm just going to continue. I'm not going to try to understand it. And the way to tackle xenographobia, I think, is just to put more of these weird charts out there, expose people more to these chart types. And um, when people get exposed to these novel charts, um, they will uh, gradually be better at understanding them. And so I think one of the our tasks as publishers or makers, creators of um, visualizations is also to experiment. And, and sometimes you can come up with really um, powerful visualizations that um, show one aspect of a certain data set much better than just bars and lines. And so that's a bit the, the goal of um, the website Xenographics. Um, let's take a closer look at some of the uh, examples in the collection. Um, this is called uh, a Chernoff map or uh, a map of Chernoff faces. faces. Um, and Chernoff faces were a technique uh, or are a technique developed in the 70s to visualize multidimensional data. Um, and I think I can best explain what you're looking at by seeing this chart in context. So it was published by Axios, an um, American news website. And um, each phase in this map or in this visualization represents the statistics of one of the states um, of the United States. When you hover over a phase, you get the data and it gives you already a hint of how to read these phases. So we're looking at Wisconsin here. And for example, in the tooltip, uh, the first element there um, shows you that the, the color of the skin of these faces is encoding the rate of uninsured people. Um, so bright yellow means a lot of insured people. If I take one of the darker uh, faces, then you see that it's more uninsured um, people. And in each element on these faces, like the, um, the shape of the mouth, um, the backs uh, under the eyes, the size of the eyes is all encoding data. Um, so, for each state, you have up to six statistics visualized into a single phase. And channel phases have had a lot of criticism and rightly so. I think in a lot of circumstances, they will not work. But when you have statistics that um, are related to people, and for example, the, um, the bags under the eyes um, represent statistics about how much people sleep so there's a direct relation between the statistics and and what the face uh, what the faces are showing and in that case i think they do work and if you think about it this chart or map is uh, packing a lot of data um, into it so one of the categories in uh, xenographics is called glyphs and glyphs are these symbols um, where a lot of elements are encoding data. So you have color, you have shape, um, you might have a size of different things. Um, so glyphs are um, one technique um, that I highlight in xenographics to encode a lot of data at once. And of course, you have to come up with uh, good glyphs to make everything readable. And in this case, in this case um, the faces work. Um, in other cases, they will probably not work um, as well. Uh, I think this might be my favorite um, example from the collection. It is called an OD map, and OD stands for origin destination. Um, so it's a map that shows you the movement between different uh, geographical areas. Um, so you're looking at, again, a map of the United States. And the map is divided into this grid and each grid, um, and it will probably not be very uh, visible through the zoom, 
uh, streaming, but each cell of the grid contains a mini copy of the map. So each grid cell contains, again, a small copy of the, the map of the United States. And then if you look at the legend, um, you can see that the colors represent the expectation of migration and blue is less than expected and red is more than expected. Um, so each small map shows you where in the US um, there is more migration from than expected or less migration from than expected. Um, so in a way, um, well, if it, this is not really clear, I'll uh, invite you to take a look at Xenographics and, and, and inspect the map a bit better. But it's a map made of small copies of itself and the colors used on the map shows you how um, the movement between the grid cell and the rest of the bigger map uh, is composed. Um, so it's kind of a fractal map. It's a map of maps. Um, and I, I like this technique um, very much. <clears throat> this is one of the, the weirder uh, charts that I found and it, it comes from a research paper. So there were some scientists who actually um, research how this chart type could work and then what would uh, the benefits be. Um, so you see two time series, one in this brown color and another, another in this yellow greenish color. And what they did here is they placed the two time series on top of each other. But then they took another step and what they did uh, was to place the areas of the time series with the highest values always in the back. Um, and so you kind of get a layer chart um, where the lowest value is always in front and the highest value is always um, at the back. So there it's a kind of a 2.5D chart. Um, and I don't know exactly if they mention any benefits in the research, research paper of this technique. Um, but I, I was intrigued um, to say the least, and that's why I added it also to the collection. Um, so sometimes you will see techniques that are not very helpful. And um, I also had research papers describing some technique um, that I was not convinced of at all that it would work in any case. So I, I didn't um, add those to the collection. Um, but I can imagine that um, for some time series, um, this, this might be helpful, um, but I haven't seen any uh, application of this technique in the wild. Um, then this is um, a page from a newspaper uh, from the Netherlands. It's already quite old. It's from December 2008. Um, and it shows you the price of stocks at the Amsterdam Stock Exchange um, from the beginning of 2007 on the left to um, December 2008 on the right. And of course, this was the period when um, the, the credit crisis was happening. And so you see a lot of red, which means that all these stocks um, were going down as a result of the crisis. And the designer of the chart, he, he used a very, at that time, very novel technique. It's called a horizon chart. And the horizon chart allows you to pack a lot of data into a limited amount of space. And I wouldn't consider a horizon chart um, a xenographic anymore because um, I have seen quite some applications of it, but still is a chart that many people are not familiar with. And um, the author of the chart, Frederik Ruys from the Netherlands, he, um, he also knew this, that people would not understand this chart from, the, from just looking at it. So you can see on the right here, um, in the bottom, he has, he has some frames that explain how the reader should uh, read the chart. Um, and at that time, at the end of 2008, this was something very novel. Um, and this is an image that I got from an actual research paper. So if I open it, um, you can see um, this is from the University of Stanford. And uh, in the paper, they describe the technique and they also tested it on people. So um, they 
expose people to this chart and then uh, ask some questions about um, the values in the chart. Um, and in the end, they concluded that um, it's it's a quite a good technique to um, to show um, time series data. And uh, as I mentioned, you can pack a lot of data into a limited amount of space. Um, Frederick, the author of the chart, also made this little animation. Um, and I think it explains very well how this horizon chart is composed. So what you do is you divide the, uh, the range of the values into bands, and then you flip over the negative values. If you have them, you flip them over to the top. Um, and the, uh, the darker colors represent the highest or the lowest values. And uh, in that way, Frederick managed to show 50 time series on one page in the newspaper. Um, and so I think this shows the, the benefit that some of these novel charts can have over uh, regular um, line charts, for example. If you would have a line chart with 50 lines, that would be simply um, unreadable. And if you would have 50 line charts, um, below each other, they would all be quite flat because the horizontal, the vertical space for each line chart would be limited. So, um, someone who should mute him or herself. Thank you. Um, So for examples of xenographics, I really invite you to uh, explore the collection. There, is, um, there are many others in there. And then of course, if you have these novel techniques um, or if you want to make a line chart, uh, a chart that goes beyond pie charts, bar charts and, uh, and line charts, of course, tools like Excel will not be really helpful. Um, and I know people who can get really creative with Excel. Um, Excel can be used to produce many kind of things. Um, if you are willing to calculate dummy variables and things like that, um, make parts of the charts invisible. So it's quite flexible, um, but of course it, it's, it, it has its limitations. And this is something that the authors of raw charts also experienced. Um, and so um, where Excel stops in terms of chart types and, and xenographics, that's where uh, raw graphs enters the, the stage. And raw graphs is already a couple of years old and they recently uh, launched their version two. Um, and um, I thought it was already a great tool, but now with version two, it has become even better. Um, I'm not going to demo the tool because that's what the, the next speaker is going to do. Um, but I wanted to show you the about page because it really explains well um, what raw graphs is all about. So if you read the second paragraph here, it says primarily conceived as a tool for designers and phys geeks, raw graphs aims at providing a missing link between spreadsheet applications like Microsoft Excel, Apple Numbers, Open Refine, and vector graphics editors like Adobe Illustrator, Inkscape, and Sketch. Um, and this summarizes it very well. Um, you can get very creative in, in Illustrator, for example, um, but there you have to do everything manually. There is no connection anymore between what you draw and, and the original data. If you edit the data, um, nothing will happen in, in the visual because there is no connection. You have to do everything manually. Um, while in Excel, of course, if you change a value in a cell, it will be reflected in, in the charts you produce. Um, and as I mentioned, the chart types that Excel offers only go so far. Um, it's quite limited. Um, and so there definitely was a need for a tool that could produce um, yeah, more xenographic-like um, visualizations and that couldn't be made with Excel or other tools. And um, I think the people um, who developed raw graphs did an excellent job in there. Um, so here you see the collection of charts that you can make with raw graphs currently. 
Um, there are 24 and not all are xenographics. And this is different from version one. So you also have bar charts, tech bar chart and, and um, line chart, for example, Do those are the, the regular ones. But um, yeah, there are many different ones, um, many templates for different charts that you cannot produce with uh, Excel or other tools. Um, so I said, I'm not going to demo the tool, um, but what I would like to share is how I have used uh, raw graphs in the past um, and how, I'm, am I, how I am using it today. Um, so almost, yeah, more than six years ago, I was working at um, a newspaper here in Flanders called The Tide. And in the beginning of the year, there was this big event around cars. Uh, it's, a, it's a regular event um, where people go to this big um, location in Brussels to look at all new cars, maybe buy cars, and all the um, car manufacturers are offering, offering discounts on, on their cars. So it's, it's a big event. And I was working at the business newspaper, so we wanted to do something around cars. And um, I found the data of all registered cars in Belgium with their brands and their types. And what I did was um, I made a tree map. Um, and of course, nowadays you can even make tree maps in Excel. At that time, it was still a bit hard to produce. Um, and so what I did was I took the data, I put it in raw graphs and raw graphs gave me the frame of the visualization. You can download a vector file, um, an SVG file of the tree map. Um, I was working more for the online part of the newspaper. So I passed this SVG file to the people making the graphics for print um, and they added the logos and they, um, they formatted the text and, and, and so on. They put on these colors in the chart. They finished it uh, really to, to be um, published. And so um, what you can see here, for example, is that Volkswagen is the most popular brand in Belgium. And the one on the top left is the Volkswagen Golf um, with 219,000. It's the most popular car in, on the Belgian roads. Here I made it a little bit bigger. Um, it, it shows you what raw graphs was meant to be really. Um, it, it's not meant to be a tool where you can finish everything in the design of your, um, of your chart. So um, in version two, you have some limited editing that you can do on fonts, for example. Um, but if you really want to make um, professional graphics, then you need to take the output of raw graphs and, and put it into Illustrator, for example, to, to really finish, um, yeah, apply finishing touches to the visualization. Um, so we're in the Stockholm data visualization meetup. So I wanted to highlight Volvo here on the, on the tree map. Um, it's the 11th most popular brand uh, on Belgian roads. And so um, here's where you can find the, the tree, map, tree map template in raw graphs. Um, second example, uh, also from the time where I was working at the newspaper, um, I was working there when the Panama Papers were released. So a big leak of documents about um, people creating offshore companies to um, hide income and wealth from the um, tax office um, in, in many different countries. So the data that we got was data ab about people, um, then intermediaries, um, so banks in, in, in Belgium, but also in other countries, who then set up offshore companies in, in these tax um, havens um, like the British Virgin Islands and things like that. So let me show you a bit better how that works. Um, so on the left, you have these people, rich people. Um, they um, went through banks in Belgium, but also in Luxembourg and Switzerland. And those banks then set up uh, companies in the British Virgin Islands, in Panama, in Anguilla, and, and these other um, tax havens. 
So it shows you the distribution between, um, yeah, here you, in, on the top you can see um, the, the biggest intermediaries. Um, then, um, and on the right, you can see what the most popular tax haven was for the Belgian customers in the leaked data. So here again, I used a template from raw graphs. Um, it's called the alluvial diagram. Uh, I put in the data, I uh, set up the, the visualization and I downloaded the vector file, which I then passed on to the people producing the graphics for the, um, from the printed newspaper. Um, and I think if I would have to produce this chart today, I'll probably code it. Um, but back in the day, my coding skills were quite limited. And I think that is also one of the powers of raw graphs, that you can make these custom charts, um, weird looking charts that you cannot make with other tools without having to code. Um, many of these visualizations you cannot make uh, without coding if it wasn't for raw graphs. So um, I think this is also one of the powers of, um, of the tool. Um, another example, also uh, from the time I was working at the newspaper, but here I use raw graphs in, um, in a different way. Um, sorry, let me show you what we made. So this was at the time uh, when there was a big merger between two big breweries, SAB Miller and um, AB InBev. And uh, together they had a portfolio of, um, I'm not sure anymore, I'm more than 200, I think even 250 brands of beer across um, all continents and in many different countries. So I wanted to show how big that portfolio of uh, beer brands was for, for this um, big merch mega brewery. And um, I split it up geographically, but I um, specifically didn't want to produce a map. So I choose for this um, round circular visualization. So you um, have these layers of the hierarchy um, in, in the visualization. The inner circle are the continents, then you have the countries, and then within countries, you have the different brands of beer. Um, and when you hover, over um, any of these um, brands of beer, it shows you a little um, image of what that uh, bottle of beer of that brand looks like. Um, and so this was developed for online and, uh, and interactive. Um, so I couldn't really use raw graphs to produce the final outcome. I used raw graphs to get a sense of how this would look like before having to code the whole visualization. So um, I collected the data of all these brands of beers. I put it into raw graphs and I experimented with different um, templates in raw graphs. Um, and then I noticed that this one was um, actually useful and it looked quite good. And so um, I knew what I needed to do and then I started coding. So this is a, a, a graphic made with D3 um, in, in JavaScript. Um, but before I started working on coding this, um, I used raw graphs to get a sense of how the final product would look like without uh, first having to code um, and, and, and then maybe afterwards having to uh, realize that this wasn't really a, a good option. Uh, as a chart type, but I saw in raw graphs that it worked quite well. And so then I started coding it. So this is the circular dendrogram um, in the uh, templates from raw graphs. There's also a linear dendrogram version, um, but it's the circular was um, more dense. So uh, it, was, it was also printed. Um, and it, the, the, the circular form um, matched the page a bit better. Um, and online, we also used the circular dendrogram. And that's a bit uh, the way that I use raw graphs now today. Um, 
I, I use row graphs to see what the shape of the data is for any of these uh, specific chart types. Um, I usually work for online publications and there um, it's uh, actually a bit more convenient to go to visualization. Um, but as I said, it's, it's nice if you already have a sense of how the final visualization will look like before having to code everything. Um, so this is a visual and I have to admit this is not by me. This was by one of my colleagues um, with a small team of three data visualization people. We worked on the Atlas of Sustainable Development Goals for the World Bank. Um, and in the first story, let me scroll until it is in view, um, contains this bee swarm chart. Um, and it's about poverty rates in different countries. So you have these bubbles scale by population. You can see that China and India have the, the biggest bubbles. Um, and uh, this is a situation in 93. So right is more poverty, less uh, poverty is on the left. And if you scroll, uh, it should stick, yes. And then it should move to the um, situation in 2017 where uh, everything is, has moved to the left. So you can see that there's um, less poverty um, now than there was um, in 1993. So this is a bee swarm um, chart. And here uh, you can see that um, this is also one of the templates of raw graphs. And the bee swarm plot is a chart type that I quite like. It's um, very nice chart type if you want to show distributions. And it you can pack also a lot of different dimensions um, in the chart. So if you look at it here, we have the position on the um, X axis, the size of the bubbles, and we also have colors. Um, so um, three dimensions visualized in a very easy to grasp uh, chart. Um, so bee swarm is um, very nice. And I like that um, raw graphs also added it to their collection of templates. Um, in version one, there was also a template for horizon charts, um, but I just noticed that it's not in the current templates of version two, but I'm sure this will be added uh, in a later stage as well. Um, so horizon charts should end up in this collection as well. So that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, my love for xenographics and, and how they can be quite powerful. Um, and also my love for raw graphs, which is a free tool, which doesn't um, require you to install anything. It runs in the browser, all your data stays local. So there is nothing going, there's no data sent to any servers. And, and it's open source. So if you like, you can even uh, extend it with your own chart templates. Um, so um, yeah, I, I hope that I have been able to inspire you and um, that I have sparked something in you that you uh, now also would like to use raw graphs, which um, I can ha highly recommend. So thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you so much for uh, for a great presentation and uh, all these uh, cool examples. Very uh, uh, interesting to see. So um, yeah, please uh, write in the chat if you have any questions. I uh, have a couple of them myself, so I will start with that. Um, so um, when you are creating charts in raw graphs, what uh, parts of um, the final visualization, do you usually have to um, add afterwards somewhere else if we're talking about the static? Yeah, it's um, mostly the fonts and, uh, um, and also um, colors there. You can pick colors in raw graphs, but um, if, if it's if you want to match colors from um, other parts of your styling, the styling of your publication, then it's much easier to do in Illustrator than in raw graphs. 
Um, but I, I would say um, fonts is the most important thing. Um, and also moving labels, for example, um, to, the, to a better location is also something that I do post-processing in, uh, in raw graphs. And uh, then you also um, um, mentioned that uh, you are sometimes using uh, JavaScript afterwards when you are satisfied with the uh, with the way it looks like. And uh, um, does the export from RowGraph somehow assist you in um, providing a template for the JavaScript code? Uh, there, in version one, there was an, an option to export the, the, the data behind the visualization um, in a JSON format, but I, I actually never used it. And I suppose it's possible to also manipulate the, the SVG that comes out of raw graphs, but that's something that I um, also never explored. Um, so I use raw graphs just to get a sense of how things would look like, and then I would start from scratch in, in JavaScript. So I've never used the, the output of raw graphs directly in, in my coding. And uh, we also have a question from uh, Danilo about uh, whether you use any other online visualization tools apart from D3, for example, Tableau. Um, the other two that I usually recommend are um, Data Wrapper, which is um, a tool originally designed to be used in, in newsrooms. So it's um, a very quick tool. Um, but it produces high, uh, high quality outputs, uh, but only for very standard charts. So different kinds of bar charts, line charts. Um, you can also publish tables with it, um, but um, nothing like uh, Xenographics um, in there. But it's a very, very good tool. And the other tool I can recommend is Flourish which is a bit similar to Data Wrapper, but um, it's more um, aimed at producing animated um, or interactive visualization. So um, with it, you can add filters, for example, so people can um, toggle things and you can also animate charts between different states, um, which is also quite powerful. Um, so I think those two are the, the main ones that I can recommend, Data Wrapper and Flourish. Uh, in the, do you also use them in your uh, workflow when experimenting? Uh, yes, and I even uh, I have used Flourish in a, a client project as well. Um, one of the more powerful features it has is that you can compose a slideshow of different visualizations which are animated between them. And um, you can add audio to the slides and an autoplay. So you, you kind of get an, um, it, it's like a video, but the, the visualization is always interactive. And you can still interact with it while the, the audio is playing. And um, it's, yeah, it's a very nice format. And um, it was nice working with it. You can really tell a story um, with, uh, with that feature of Flourish. And uh, another question I had is um, if you have any frustrations with the row graphs. Uh, not really, to be honest. Um, what sometimes happened, but I think it is it has improved in version two, is that whenever you paste your data and there's something wrong with your data, it would just tell you um, there's something wrong with your data, but it would not tell you what is the problem. Um, but um, I notice now that whenever, well, the, the, the user interface for pasting in your data has improved a lot and it even recognizes the, the data types like uh, dates and numbers and, and, and strings. Um, so um, I think in version two, they tackled this problem in a nice way. Um, but that was the, the, the main issue that I, uh, that I sometimes had, yeah. We've got uh, one more question from uh, from Patrick about what uh, tools you use for touching up 
the output from raw graphs? Um, I must admit, I haven't done um, much work in this area. As I mentioned, while I was working at the newspaper, I passed it to the, the graphic designers who de designed the visualizations for print. Um, but uh, I have I have done some some uh, work like that, and I always use Illustrator. I'm I'm by no means someone who can draw or or has a, a lot of um, knowledge about design. But um, I know my way around Illustrator a little bit. But it's just um, yeah to place labels and to change fonts basically. Thank you. And, um, yeah, now um, also another question from uh, Marta about whether, yeah, which specific JavaScript library you use for visualization. Uh, that, that, yeah, I think like most of the visualizations um, coded in JavaScript, it's D3 that is the, the most um, flexible one. Um, so, when I make static charts, I use um, a language called R and a package called ggplot2. Um, but when it's for online and interactive and, and when uh, things need to be very customized, then I think D3 is by far the, the best option. Thank you. And yeah, I know we also got a question about uh, xenographics. Uh, so um, Alenka is asking, whether you think uh, that fighting xenophobia would be a way of increasing data literacy, and uh, where is the sweet spot not to use too exotic xenographics? Uh, yeah, so I, I definitely think that one solution to xenographobia is just um, publishing more of these non-standard visualizations. But it's true, um, you might overwhelm people. Um, so the speed spot is in those visualizations that are a bit more complex, but that have a great reward whenever people understand them. Um, and if, if you can produce graphics like this, this that requires a little bit of attention of the reader, but then afterwards the reader gets a lot of return for that attention, um, that's, that's what you should aim for. And um, how far you can go depends on the, the graphicacy of the, the audience that you're targeting. If they are very um, accustomed to working with numbers or if they um, are, um, yeah, if they have a lot of knowledge about different chart types, then of course you can go a little bit further than um, when you're um, targeting, I don't know, people, um, yeah, the general public, for example, or maybe even children, then of course you cannot go so far. Um, but I think that the return on the attention of people, that's that's what you should aim for. Yeah, that's a really good point uh, about also, um, yeah, thinking of the alternatives that you have in uh, creating those charts, maybe not right away jumping onto uh, something very weird, but yeah, and, and what also helps if you make or, or publish these charts is what um, Frederick Raus did with his horizon charts, explain the chart in steps. Um, so don't present the chart just as is to, to the people, but maybe first explain one axis, then another axis, then the colors, uh, I don't know, it depends on the chart type. Um, but really guide the reader into the visualization. Um, be smart about labeling things on the chart that can also help um, people understand the, the weird chart they are exposed to. Thanks a lot. Uh, just a, um, a final question about um, the, oh no, we got one more, but <laughs> it's great. Um, uh, I was uh, wondering the uh, graphs that you collected to your uh, xenographics uh, portal, where were they coming from? What is like, the most common source? Is it articles or scientific papers? Uh, I think it's a mix, um, but the two most common, uh, let's say three most common sources are first Wikipedia, 
um, what I did was I just searched Wikipedia for graph and chart, and then you get this very specific um, charts and graphs. Uh, so that's one source. The, the other one is scientific papers. So there is um, a conference called IEEE VIS, um, which is held every two years or every year, I'm not sure. Um, and they post their papers uh, in a repository. Um, so for a couple of editions of that conference, I just skimmed to all the, the papers to see if there were any new chart types um, being published about. And then the last one is the, the media. Um, so I follow a lot of uh, newsrooms who are doing interesting stuff in, in data journalism. Um, and there you can also find um, a lot of innovation going on when it comes to um, creative data visualizations. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the, um, the final question, I think before we jump to the next presentation, it's uh, from Sandra and it's a bit long, so I'm going to read it. Um, I'm teaching data visualization and I focus exactly on the tools you mentioned, but I get more and more pressure from the industry to teach Tableau and Power BI and Python instead of R. Do you face this kind of situation and what is your view on this? Um, I think Python and R are a bit on the same level. Um, I use R, but um, Python is also very good. The, the main difference is, I, in my view, the ggplot2 package, which I use to make visualizations, um, which is very, very flexible. Um, and there is not yet really an alternative um, in Python. Um, there are some words going on, but um, I think it's uh, not there yet. And tools like Tableau and Power BI are to me, something, um, an, another class of tools um, aimed at people um, who don't code um, and who are very happy with charts that are limited to the templates that those tools offer and to the design options that those tools offer. So um, I think they are meant to be used in a business setting um, and um, I think if you really want to, I don't know, make visualizations for um, for media, for example, those tools will not be um, will not be able to do what you, what you need to do in terms of um, creative data visualization and and very nice looking charts. So it depends really who the target users of those tools are. If you uh, are teaching in uh, to economic students, for example, then uh, probably Tableau and uh, Power BI are good options. If you are teaching in, um, um, yeah, maybe data journalists, for example, then um, Data Wrapper and Flourish will be nice. And then um, for people who, who code, who like to code, uh, or who are already familiar with coding, then, then R and Python are the best options. Yeah, um, I agree also with the fact that kind of targeting the, the audience and then choosing the tool based on that, it's a good point. Thank you so much for the presentation and for great answers. Uh, I hope wish we could uh, speak even longer, but um, we have another presentation as well. So we need to reserve some time for that. Thanks again, Martin. Okay, thanks for having me. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Max Grace, um, database engineer at Mural. She has uh, also written for Nightingale, the online data visualization journal. And uh, even though she is based in the US, she was part of um, our Stockholm group for some time and kindly agreed to share her perspectives on raw graphs. So Max, looking forward to your talk. Please take Thanks, over. Okay. 
so everyone can see the first slide then. Yes. Awesome. Um, so I decided to title this, make a tweetable data visualization with raw graphs in one hour. And I think that it really highlights one of the best use cases of raw graphs, although there's many that have been outlined um, that were outlined by Martin. And so there might be a little bit of overlap, but I hope to give a different perspective. Um, I was excited to give this talk because, I mean, I come from a di completely different background than him and I spend a lot of time researching tools and like how to combine tools. And I think it's a really interesting topic, especially because there's so many out there. And a lot of people are very curious about tech stacks. I mean, there was tons of questions um, just like a few minutes ago about that too. And like how you combine tools because most or many tools aren't um, like a one-stop shop. Usually you combine them with something else or often you do. Um, I also thought it was a good use case because I am no designer and I've been using Illustrator maybe like two months. And before giving this talk, I used raw graphs like twice. <laughs> um, so I thought it would be a good opportunity for me to learn a bit more about it. And it also kind of offered like a fresh perspective on raw graphs. Um, yeah, so I also, a little bit more about me, I come from more of, I guess, an engineering background. I primarily use D3 because there's a lot of flexibility and I often use um, Vega Lite for prototyping because that's also written in um, JavaScript. It's also a JavaScript library in JSON. So the goals of this is just um, kind of basic how to, how to go from data to data visualization and raw graphs. I know that like jumping into a new tool can kind of be daunting. And so I thought it might be nice to just like see the flow, even though raw graphs is like a pretty easy and intuitive tool, which is awesome. Um, but like any tool, it also has benefits and limitations. So I'm just going to talk about my uh, opinions about that and also when I personally would use it and maybe when you should too. Um, and this is this data visualization I found is um, from raw graphs and probably edited in something like Illustrator Inkscape. Um, let's see. And there's another one. This one's by Ali Turbin, who has a data visualization podcast. So Martin kind of talked about this already, but raw graphs is a drag and drop data visualization framework. So you can quickly explore data sets and create semi-finished vector graphics. And I think that um, these two points are pretty important because raw graphs isn't claiming to be for you to be able to create final um, presentation worthy data visualizations. Its main goal is just like to explore data sets and to be able to finish them somewhere else. And so already I really like their mission statement because they're not, they're more conveying that they wanna be like a piece for the puzzle and a tool to help you be there, but not trying to be everything at once. And I think that really plays to one of its strengths, not by not trying to do too much. So for my third time using um, raw graphs, I decided to time box myself using a data set I had. Um, I've been trying to explore and I kind of prototyped a bit on um, with Vega Lite, um, but I didn't really have any like data vision sketches in mind. And so I kind of asked myself, like, how would I, without having data sketches or any sketches in mind, how would I go from a data set to a data visualization in less than an hour. I think I did this in like 30 minutes. So I also spent some time getting acquainted with raw graphs. And I'm not saying that this is a masterpiece by any means, but it was a first iteration and I also made it in like 30 minutes. So <laughs> I think that's pretty cool because even though I love D3 and I love making stuff in D3 or um, other um, using other tools, there's nothing that would allow me to make something so quickly without much of an idea. 
So with that in mind, I'm going to go out of this and we're going to go into raw graphs. So I already picked up um, or I have a data set that I'm working with. It's the same one that I made that visualization with. Um, and this is a data set that I have on fermented foods around the world. So first off, raw graphs allows you to paste, upload, and you can even try data set samples, which is really nice. They really focus on learning, um, which is why it's also a great tool for people who are just starting out in data visualization. Oh wait, this is, oops, okay. So I'm just gonna drag and drop this. And as Martin mentioned, now it um, kind of gives you a warning. That's one reason why I wanted to use this because there's some places where it's blank and it tells you exactly well, it says that it's in row 89 and then two other issues. Um, unfortunately, this is one thing as an engineer that I don't like that much is that you need to have like a pretty clean data set. There's no filtering options that I'm aware of, although you can um, like delete and um, yeah, you can delete things. I, you can't delete row, rows though, but um, you can, do different like stacking and um, like separating by commas. So um, just so you're acquainted with this data set, there's um, a ferment. So these are just like various ferments around the world. Um, there's the ID, the pH, because this is a range. So I decided to split that into two. Um, there's like the fermentation time, which I also split into two, it's in days. Um, AW, which I always forget what this means, <laughs> and then um, the main ingredient. Um, and this data set still isn't like super clean, but it's something that I'm, it's a work in progress. So I thought that would be fun to explore. So after you get your data set in, you can choose a chart. Um, and this layout I particularly really like in raw graphs because it gives you um, it's kind of like a cheat sheet. So when I was saying like go from when you don't have like a data sketch in mind or maybe like don't know exactly what your data looks like, you can still like even without knowing what these graphs really are, what they're used for, you can get some basic idea. So if I look at my data set and I say that I'm interested in knowing like what is the most used main ingredient, for example. Then I can look here and see that maybe, I mean, that's a hierarchy. So maybe I could use a tree map. I could use like circle packing or a circular dendrogram. So that's pretty cool already. So I'm gonna click circle graph and or circle packing and it gives me a little description of that. There's even tutorials and coding that goes along with it. And then afterwards you just scroll down and we already saw this, um, but it gives you all of the different dimensions that you can have and nicely shows like what is mandatory and what isn't. So, I mean, already all I need to do is like pull this there, main ingredient, and then I already have like a basic setup. I mean, that takes like two minutes or something if you really, if you know what you want. Um, and then you can make it even more, let's see, you can add um, labels since probably I don't wanna know what we're looking at. And as Martin said, like the labels and the colors are really the thing that's lacking in here, but I think that I am actually happy that there's not so many different options because since this isn't where you're supposed to be making your final data visualization, you don't really want to be caught up in all of the stylistic attributes. I think that for me, this is just like a way to get a structure, but perhaps that's also just the way that I'm kind of thinking about um, use cases for it. You can also, as I was saying, add in the color but the colors I've had a lot of issues with. Um, so for example, like with the ferment, that doesn't work as well. Um, 
so go back to main ingredient. And you can't really, you can't rearrange them and like reassigning is pretty manual. So it's, um, yeah, so it's not ideal basically. <laughs> Because one issue I found when I was trying to do this data visualization is I thought it would be nice to um, kind of make it on a sequential because you're going from like least amount to, or like a higher count of ferments. And so I thought that, oh, I can just put in ferment here. And then this is like a nice sort of like filtering touch is that you can do like count And so you still get just like an ordinal, which is fine, but you can't really change it. As I was saying, you can only change it manually. But in any case, um, the basic functions are wonderful and you get the option to export it into either a SVG or a PNG JPEG raw graphs. And I think it's nice that they add raw graphs because as Martin was saying, there's no way to save what you're doing. So if you refresh, you've lost everything you've done. So you need to save it. And I guess it can work to your advantage, meaning that like your data isn't saved online, but it can also be a little frustrating considering that other softwares um, let you save it online. So if we save it as an SVG, I'll just do like ferment circles, download it, open that up in Finder. And so I like to use Illustrator, but that's just because I have it. Um, oops. Other people use um, Inkscape, I believe, and I've used Figma before, but only for like UI stuff. So let's see about this. So all you need to do is like drag and drop, and then you've already have a basic thing that you can play around with. Um, yeah, so it's just like ridiculously easy. And having um, like putting this into a vector, um, a vector software like Illustrator is incredibly powerful because I mean, Illustrator has like thousands and thousands of fonts and colors. And I'm not gonna go into like all of the tips and tricks you can use in Illustrator, but some ideas are to, um, it has a lot of great features to like change all of the colors or to pull in pictures and change the colors that way. And so when you think of how powerful these like outside software programs are um, like Inkscape and Illustrator, there's like real, almost no need for um, raw graphs to try to, I mean, to try to like achieve those goals because they already do them so well. Um, so I hope that gave you some small idea. I just wanted to spend a few more minutes going into what I, just to like, summarize the pros and cons of raw graphs and then maybe answer specific questions. And if you have specific questions about the workflow, I'd be happy to go into that in detail. I just wanted to like give an overview of what, um, of how it works so that you can, you're kind of like getting your feet wet. So let's go back here. Awesome. Yeah, so that's what I came up with in 30 minutes and no masterpiece, but I think that's pretty cool because as Martin was saying, there's a lot of complex graphs that would take a lot of time to make. Okay, I missed that one. So recap and reflections. And I thought I would split this up in two. Um, and by that, I mean, so giving the case study of like information designers and how they might use raw graphs benefits they get from it. And then also engineers, because they're two completely different case studies as people were mentioning in the chat. So for information designers, I think that the prototyping feature is really, really nice. There's not that many places to kind of prototyping and um, for prototyping and without coding and seeing the shape of the data. I mean, you can just like go back and forth between um, 
like clicking between different hierarchies, for example, and seeing which layout you visually like, and it takes no time at all. It's just drag and drop. So the other benefit, obviously, you don't need any engineering skills. If you're super familiar with Inkscape or Illustrator, you can really like show off what you use. And there's been amazing data visualizations that are made in raw graphs that there's no way that they could be made in Tableau, which aims to be kind of an end all. Um, I also really like the chart type cheat sheet. So I've included that for both. Um, the frustrating features, I guess, would be the limited UI controls and colors, maybe also the, um, the point that you can't save work online. But I think that the benefits far outweigh the limitations. And I did also notice a few bugs when I was going through it, but I think those will be improved since the community behind raw graphs is so motivated and active. It's also open source, so anyone can contribute to it, which in my book means that it's probably going to have a lot um, a long life span. So for engineers, um, it's really amazing for prototyping and data exploration. I did say that I like to use VegaLite for data exploration, but the fact of the matter is it doesn't have all of the chart types. Um, and it also takes a lot more time to code. You need to like format data and you also need to put it into a code editor, whether that be observable or somewhere else. Um, as Martin said, it's built on D3, which is great if you use D3 because you'll be able to, you know how the chart, the end chart, or at least like the first iteration of the chart, the basic chart would look like on it um, because you're working with the, um, the framework already. I also really like that it takes a data first approach. And by that, I mean, you put the data in, you choose the type and then you design it. Um, that logic is like pretty standard for engineers, probably for and anybody working in data visualization. But I guess I mean versus like first picking the chart and then adding the data, which I know that some programs do. Again, I added the chart type cheat sheet because everyone needs a reminder. And when you're thinking of, um, for example, if you know that your question is going to be showing time scale, it's nice to be able to see and maybe be inspired by other graphs in there when you can see, oh, that also uses time scale. Well, I never really thought about that because I usually use like scatter plots or something. But for engineers, some frustrating features would be that there's no interactivity. So it's mostly for static and it's not really flexible. Um, and by that, I mean, with like the limited data wrangling and positioning and stuff like that. Um, and you also can't save work online. So I would probably, unless I was building um, a static data visualization, I would probably use D3 just because I like how interactive it is and I want to be a D3 expert. So it's always good to get practice, but raw graphs is still great for making something in no time at all. Um, and also getting prototyping ideas. So I would still use it for that. Um, and I do use it for static data visualizations when my engineering skills don't match up to my vision. Um, I also thought it would be fun to compare raw graphs to Flourish because I've also used Flourish um, a couple of times. And so this was using the same data and also choosing the same um, graph or same chart type, which was the hierarchical tree diagram. Um, and just based off of this, I do think that Flourish's UI or that it's like, it's visually more attractive, but Flourish in my book seems to be more of an end all. It also has like interactive features, which is nice and multiple font types. But while I was making the same chart in Flourish, I ended up taking a lot more time to do it in Flourish um, because that it had so many features and options. But at the same time, it didn't have everything that I wanted. And I knew that I would eventually put it into Illustrator. And so in my book, it kind of detract around the point because although Flourish can be seen as an inter, um, intermediary like raw graphs, 
it still has more features, but maybe not as many as you want there to be. So it almost seemed more limiting to me since its mission isn't um, as like an intermediate necessarily as an intermediary step. So that was just my um, thoughts about flourish versus raw graphs. So just to finalize that reflection, I think it's really great for beginners because it has like a bunch of cheat sheets, super easy to use. You can get familiar with graphs and chart types. It's wonderful for static data visualizations because you can put it into um, Illustrator, Inkscape, Figma, great for prototyping. So that's, I mean, engineers or information designers alike should enjoy that feature. Um, I especially think it's great for information designers. I know that I'm forgetting her name exactly, so I'm very sorry, but Valentina um, uses it a lot and she makes incredible data visualizations. It's also great for saving time because you can make something, as I was saying, in like 30 minutes or one hour and have it be presentable as long as you, I mean, I think that you should probably put it into Illustrator or some other um, software to beautify it, of course. And especially if you have a vision, because since, I mean, raw graphs is called raw graphs, it doesn't aim to be anything more than that. Um, so the magic is really having an idea of what you want the end product to look like. So for what it's not best at is interactivity, also like the flexibility, um, such as like data wrangling and filtering functions, which I should mention Flourish does have, and that's nice. Um, final visualizations, but that's fine, as I've said. And geographical data, um, because they don't have any way to make maps at this point. So that's not an option. So just to finalize that, I think it's a great program to get scaled data that you just like add some creative features and imagination to. So thank you for listening to that talk. I hope that you learned a little bit about raw graphs or inspired to use it or have an idea about how to combine tools as well. So if you have any questions about it, I'd love to answer them if I can. Thank you uh, for, uh, for a great talk. I um, uh, haven't used the tool myself, but uh, kind of, um, uh, it was a great introduction to actually go through the different steps and uh, as well as highlight what not to expect from the tool because sometimes maybe when you're starting with something new, you can uh, expect to have everything ready, but uh, yeah, it was a great reminder uh, what to not use it for. And um, I was wondering if uh, you have tried any other chart types for that data set that you have showed us and uh, how do you mm -hmm. usually decide whether this a certain chart is good enough for your data? When, when are you satisfied with it? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, I think that it comes down to what you want the end product to look like as well. Um, I mean, I really like circles and so I picked that one, but I mean, we can try out other ones. Like I played out, I played with all of them because it takes such, it hardly takes any time at all. And so you can really just try out everything and then see what you like. Cause I mean, at the basis, I have one hierarchy, which is the main ingredient. Oh, well, for some graph, of course you need to put more in. Um, but I mean, like this one is obviously hard to read. Um, but could be interesting in some way. Um, and then you can also switch that around, I think. Oh, this version doesn't have it. Um, and then you can also, I mean, I tried the tree map as well. And I ended with the circle packing just because, as I said, I like circles and it's aesthetically pretty. Yeah, uh, I think a lot of uh, people here have the same feelings about circular visualizations. <laughs> and that one is also a circle with circles inside, so it's a double. Exactly. Uh, there's a question from uh, Alenka about um, 
uh, how the tool handles big data and if there are any um, data size limitations? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't actually know if there's any data size limitations. I mean, I've used, I think as much as like 6,000 points and that was fine. I think usually the limitation comes, I mean, it's a valid point because SVGs can have issues with that, but I feel like it's mostly for loading. And so if you're making a static visualization, I don't see that as being a huge problem, but I haven't tried anything over 6,000 points. So I'm not entirely sure how much it can handle. We'll have to see what the limit is. Yeah, maybe they um, they have it documented somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then also there is a question from uh, Brett about um, the uh, the SVGs, um, how the the SVG file is structured, and if it is preserving the the groups. Mm. Yeah, the SVG structure is preserving the groups. I mean, it's it's like using observable as well. To, I believe that observable, you can also um, download or export SVGs, or maybe I'm wrong, maybe that's just PNGs. Um, so it should preserve it, but there, I will say that there was an issue in um, Adobe Illustrator that I think they're trying to fix where it doesn't completely preserve it. So it might not be 100% accurate. I know that um, like when I put it in here, the um, titles were a bit higher and also for the tree map, it got kind of clipped. And so that is something to be aware of. It's a good point. Thank you so much for, for the answers. If um, people uh, have any questions and please uh, write them uh, in the chat but uh, otherwise i wanted to thank you for this uh, uh, a little bit uh, ad hoc talk uh, really great that you could uh, um, share your experiences and also glad that it was an opportunity for you to learn a bit more uh, about this tool so um yeah um and then um, Thanks to everyone for participating and for all your questions. I also wanted to mention um, about our next event in May. Uh, it is going to be a conversation with uh, RJ Andrews. He um, is going to talk about his new book. Uh, so we're looking forward to discussing his book with him uh, as a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So uh, that is going to be on May 7th the same time but we will post more details both on meetup and on slack so look out for the announcements and and um, now if uh, you have some energy left and uh, want to socialize a little bit uh, we wanted to use the opportunity to meet each other uh, but it is of course optional so if you have to run please feel free to do so and we will also not be recording that part. 